thank you once again, Mr. Gestor, for agreeing to take part in this. Let's begin uh, with your birthday. When and where were you born? I was born on February the 8th, uh, 1925, in Hochheim, uh, in the, uh, my parents' bedroom uh, with a midwife attending. And uh, uh, Hochheim is a suburb of Worms and Wine, uh, which is a famous uh, Jewish place. Uh, uh, but the uh, history of the Jews there goes back to uh, 1800s and thousands and so forth and so on. Uh, my first, uh, uh, in my home, were well, my parents, uh, Sigmund Gustav was my father. My mother was uh, born in Swabia. Her name was Anna Heilbronner and subsequently Gustav. And, uh, uh, they were married in Memmingen, uh, where my mother was born, and uh, uh, my uh, f father, uh, the way they got together is my uh, grandmother, my father's mother, had a sister in Munich, and they were talking, uh, uh, don't you know anybody, uh, for I have such a nice uh, niece. Uh, in Memmingen. Do, uh, do you know anybody? Oh yeah, I have a nephew, uh, Sigmund Gustav. So they, uh, he came to Memmingen with a chaperone and announced that uh, he's not going to make up his mind for six weeks at least. And so they uh, had a date with a chaperone and so forth. On the third day, he proposed to her. And they were made on the uh, August the twenty second, August the twenty seventh, nineteen twenty two, and uh, uh, in any case, getting back to Hochheim, my first memory is uh, uh, my uh, bed made in the factory in Worms. It was uh, on the wall opposite my parents' bed. And above the, my bed was a very tall Ampere mirror. And it was hung in such a way, it leaned forward a little bit. And then my first memory is the fear of that mirror coming down on me. My next memory is uh, uh, in Memmingen, where my mother was born at the marriage of uh, uh, her brother, on uh, in 1929, uh, I don't know what, I don't remember what time of the year, but I do remember that uh, my brothers didn't go. Uh, they, uh, my father composed a uh, uh, poem for me to recite to the assembled people. I know they put me at uh, the head of uh, of the table, and there was this little shaver spouting the that the poem that my father that my, my my brothers were born a year and a half after I was born. They're twins. They were born on September the seventeenth, uh, nineteen twenty-six. What are their names? Uh, uh, one is uh, John, used to be Hans, and the other one is Walter. We all had uh, Israel as a middle name uh, uh, was dictated by the Nazis. And uh, in any case, uh, uh, we grew up uh, in a well-to-do well environment. My father was a member of the uh, Deutsch Österreichische Alpenverein, the uh, German-Austrian Alpine Club, and in 1924, the year before I was born, uh, he and his uh, uh, friends or members built this uh, clubhouse uh, in the Black Forest uh, uh, above Undersmacht, uh, if it makes any difference. Anyhow, uh, we used to go there on vacation, skiing, uh, and playing in the uh, peat bog. And uh, to go forward a little bit, uh, 
1976, uh, my family and I were there, and my kids played in those peat bogs. Uh, there were depressions in the bog that had maybe a foot of water in them. They were anywhere from four to ten feet in diameter. Did they have as much fun as you did? I don't know. I didn't ask them. Uh, uh, my co cousins, of course, were part of the family, and uh, might as well bring you up to date on that. Uh, my uh, uh, father's brother lived around the corner from our home in Hochheim, and uh, there was his wife, uh, Shani was her name, and there was uh, my cousin Frank, Franz at the time, and Ruth. She looked like uh, Shirley Temple. In any case, uh, we, we were five kids uh, that grew up together and uh, used to go up in, uh, into the Black Forest there. And this uh, lasted until uh, uh, about 1934 or 5. I know uh, my father took me up there by himself uh, about that time, and I got the mumps, and he had to take care of me. And anyhow, uh, uh, that was one of the experiences. Uh, but uh, we used to roam around the factory, and they had uh, a little rail system uh, where they moved things from one part of the factory to the other, and we used to play on those, so give, them a, give a thing a push and they'd jump on. And uh, uh, I know uh, we, we went into the factory and uh, I uh, fell in the machine room and hit my head on a piece of equipment and I've suffered with that ever since. But uh, my brother John, Hans at the time, he ran down an aisle in the cabinet shop and there was a piece of plywood sticking out and he slid open his uh, cheek. But uh, there was a uh, large garden in the back of the factory that uh, my mother loved flowers and plants, and uh, she planted strawberries and stuff like that. Begin to notice life changing. Are you on? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, my parents, uh, as did all parents, try to provide a, as normal as, a pos as possible an environment. And whatever was unusual for us kids was uh, normal. So uh, there were the Nazis and uh, I mean, uh, for instance, uh, uh, my brothers had a problem with their teacher and uh, uh, my mother went to uh, the school. This was when they were in first, second, or third grade, and uh, complained to the teacher. And the teacher uh, said, uh, you have to understand, uh, Mrs. Gustav, I'm a national socialist down to my bones. Ich bin a Nationalsozialist in bis auf die Knochen, in case somebody uh, understands German, but that's the original. My mother used to quote that. And uh, about the time of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, uh, they built a Jewish school in the community building which was next to the 900-year-old temple. I, uh, another memory I have when I was nine years old was the 900 uh, uh, memorial uh, of the building of that temple. It took them 20 years to build it. It was built, completed in 1034 and destroyed a number of times since then, the last time in 1938 and 42, and rebuilt and rededicated in 1961. And uh, in any case, that's when we start going to the Jewish school in Worms, which was a three, four mile Bike ride. What so, was the name of that school? Yiddish Bezirk Schule Worms. And do you know approximately how many students attended? Uh, well, you saw the whole ball of wax uh, in that picture I showed you. Okay, uh, we'll look at that picture. Yeah. Uh, might be uh, 30, 40 people, 40 kids. 
the popul the Jewish population of uh, Worms in 1933 was 1,100. And prior to that, uh, over a period of time, uh, it was a large, larger, much larger portion of uh, the, the population. It was a significant uh, uh, portion of the population. Did and you experience uh, discrimination as a student before you attended that school? I can't say I did. Uh, it was uh, sort of out of our hands. Uh, we were, we did what we were told to do and what we needed to do, and uh, instead of going uh, on vacation to the Black Forest, my dad fixed up a room in uh, Herning in a, a little village of 200 souls uh, uh, west of Worms, and uh, he made the furniture for that room. The, it belonged to the mother of one of uh, my mother's uh, maids that she had. And uh, we and uh, friends and family, and cousin and so forth, used to go there and uh, walk in the forest. And I, uh, I have a picture of us pushing uh, that little hay wagon up the hill that uh, we used uh, during the Kristallnacht. And uh, that... Uh, stopped uh, at, the, at uh, about the time of Kristalna. I, I don't recall us being there after 1937. Was there anything that happened prior to Kristallnacht that we should know about life in uh, under the Nazi regime? I was a child then. I was a 12, 13 year old and uh, uh, most of these things were uh, beyond our uh, interest or, uh, you know, until we got older. Uh, I do remember one episode. Uh, uh, my father and his friends were assembled in our dining room and they were talking about the Nuremberg laws and uh, so forth and discrimination. And my brother Walter <laughs> piped up and says, uh, if it's so bad, why why did you vote Jewish? You know, we we were Jewish. Uh, his con concept of why we were Jewish was reflected in the, in in that question. And uh, the other the other thing during the these times uh, prior to Hitler, uh, up to Hitler's time, uh, Hitler's time, uh, he was elected chancellor in January. Of, 1933, and uh, uh, in the early 34, Hindenburg, the, the president, a former general in the uh, German army, uh, either died or retired. He was 84 years old, a year older than I am. And uh, Hitler became the chief cook and bottle washer, called the leader, or in German, the Führer. And uh, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, well, let's go to your memory of Kristallnacht, because you have... Uh, well, there's more than that. I, I was going to say, okay. uh, across from, uh, from uh, uh, our home, from the entrance to our home, which was on the side of the building, uh, was a horse stable, and uh, they had horses there that uh, would uh, uh, pull the wagons with the furniture to the railhead for transportation to wherever it was going. And I am to this day uh, kind of afraid of horses, not by reason, but by uh, just uh, feeling because uh, I recall looking up at the stomach of the, these the big black horses. Next to that was a garage. And uh, uh, when my brothers were maybe seven or eight years old, maybe six years old, uh, they got into one of the cars there. It was a, a, a large open car and released the brake. Uh, so happened that the garage was at an incline and it ran across uh, 
the courtyard there and hit the other wall. That's an incident that I remember. And uh, my father's mother lived in Worms, and she was uh, super clean. She came from Frit, uh, from a, a very prosperous, uh, uh, famous family. Uh, her brother was uh, head of uh, Triumphwerke, making little cars. In those days, they started with mattresses and bicycles and and, and uh, motorcycles. And uh, anyhow, uh, I don't know. I lost my track now. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, Tell me about your experiences growing up as a Jewish child. Was your family observant of holidays? To what extent? My father was uh, uh, very much a Jew, but not an observant Jew. Uh, going to the temple was nothing uh, that uh, he liked to do. In those days, uh, you bought a, a, a seat in the temple, and that's where you sat. That's how the membership was organized. And uh, my mother came from a, from a more observant family. They weren't orthodox by any means, but uh, they, they didn't eat pork chops and bacon and things like that, but they, they, they ate well. In Swabia and southern Germany and Austria, that was their recreation, cooking and eating well. Anyhow, uh, uh, they observed the Shabbos and and my mother's sister, she used to go to the temple uh, every Friday night, I guess. They, she and her husband lived in uh, Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, I know they, they, they made little fun of that, that uh, she would uh, go to the temple once a week. But uh, my father was also a member of the Spinoza Society. You know, you, you heard about Spinoza? The philosopher? Yeah. yeah. That was his, uh, I guess, somebody he looked up to. And uh, yeah, he had a lot of friends, for instance, uh, that uh, uh, drawing right there is uh, done by uh, Rudy from Hover. Uh, and, uh, I have other uh, pieces of his, and uh, he, he was an architect in Mainz, and my father admired him. And uh, also, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, Mr. George Nathan. He was married to a Gentile woman, and uh, he was the one that uh, represented uh, the Jewish uh, people with the Gestapo, he fought their battles for him. And uh, uh, he, uh, he got out uh, maybe six months after my parents did. Uh, my brothers and I, uh, well, maybe we ought to go to Kristallnacht yeah, first, like you should. said. Yeah, let's go there. Anyhow, uh, we arrived uh, at the school that I mentioned, uh, about a quarter to eight in the morning, and smoke was coming out of uh, the uh, archives above the women's section, where the original of this Maxer was stored, which had been scurried away by uh, Dr. Illert uh, to Darmstadt. They never found it. And uh, uh, I was the oldest uh, child there, 13 years old, and I was. Uh, the big boss, yeah. And uh, I had the idea, let's form a bucket brigade and put out the fire. And this is what we did. And evidently, uh, somebody called the Nazis and, and told them what we had done. And they came back. And uh, one of our teachers, my brother's teacher, she, she was about five foot, maybe a little bit more, and about that wide. She was a woman in her 60s, probably. And uh, she parked herself in front of the entrance of the women's section, uh, her arms outstretched, trying to block, at least symbolically, the entrance to the 
uh, synagogue. But this uh, uh, big Nazi, maybe a foot and a half taller than she was, she, he just flicked her aside like he was swishing a fly off of her, uh, his sleeve. And uh, we figured that by that time, uh, we figured that we ought to go home. So we got on our bicycles, my brothers and cousin and I. Uh, we bicycled back to Hoheim. And there we found out that uh, our fathers had been uh, arrested. That's all we knew. I mean, it's, maybe my mother knew more, but uh, uh, that was it. And somehow or other, they got the idea that we ought to pack up uh, some stuff in case we had to leave and and had to uh, go and find shelter someplace else. You know, we had this uh, uh, little toy wagon about so long and uh, piled on it uh, all the practical things. My father was very practical and skier, equestrian, mountain climber and uh, blankets and the things that we would need in case we had to live in the forest or some place other than a home. And uh, we were just about done with that, that uh, these uh, thugs that we saw at the, at the temple a couple of hours earlier or an hour earlier came around and uh, they came up the, the stairs. And I remember halfway down, uh, I remember uh, one of the factory managers coming up and he blew, uh, this was uh, now 70 years ago. And I remember the gray business suit that he wore. He, he was, a, of course, a giant. I, I barely made it up to his belt line. So uh, we all went down, took our wagon, and uh, went down the side of the building across the front. As we went across the front, our furniture uh, started flying out, out of the windows, including uh, irreplaceable uh, antiques stuffed 150, 200, 300 years old. I went around the corner to my aunt's house and uh, I remember we had a heck of a time getting that wagon into her house because there were a couple of steps and then a little ante room and then a couple of more steps. We were no sooner inside than uh, these guys came around from our home uh, into there. And, and this big guy that pushed uh, our school teacher aside, he went after my aunt, who at that time was a good looking young woman. And uh, my cousin Frank uh, jumped on his back. He was 12 years old at the time, which distracted him enough to give up uh, the chase. How we got out of there, I don't remember. But we got out of there, and we figured we ought to, uh, uh, we ought to, uh, uh, go to Worms, see what we could find or what's going on. Uh, let me regress a minute. Uh, uh, while we were getting prepared to leave, uh, I remembered uh, that a uh, <coughs> local woman, uh, Mrs. Heidelberger was her name, gave me a, a Damascus da dagger. Damascus in those days was known for its uh, very high quality steel from which they made uh, daggers and uh, swords. And this woman had the, <laughs> she wanted to get rid of it uh, for, uh, for, maybe she was afraid to have it. And she made a present of it to me. I, I can describe it in detail. Anyway, I went up to my father's shop where he made furniture and stuff for people who were still able to get take furniture with him and I broke it up in his vice into little pieces and threw it between the, the roof and, the, and the, the wall wherever it was. In 76, 1976 my son uh, looked for it and he couldn't find it. But anyway uh, 
getting back, uh, we got the, the town, and uh, I remember coming to uh, the place in front of the railroad station. There was a big crowd there, and uh, we spotted our young rabbi, he was at the time 25 years old, across uh, the square or whatever, the space in the crowd over there, and my mother gathered her courage and and uh, went through the crowd, went over there and said, what can we do? And he had the one word answer, nothing. So in any way, uh, we, uh, my, my, my mother and her sister-in-law uh, thought we would go to uh, the home of this George Nathan that I mentioned before because she was a Gentile. And uh, we got there probably just before it got dusk. It was only maybe a mile or two at the most, but uh, a mile or two going through town uh, is, a, is a long way in those days. Anyway, she wouldn't take us in. She was afraid. She says, why don't you uh, get in touch with uh, Frau Marcus, uh, Mrs. Marcus. Uh, she was Gentile and her husband uh, uh, was Jewish. An antique dealer in Fiflisheim, which is a suburb right next to Hochheim. So uh, my mother and aunt uh, parked us on a park bench. This, this was near, right near the Rhine River. It's so all the way across town. And uh, they went to look for a telephone. And you can imagine uh, talking about anxiety and, and experience. Uh, we were sitting there in the dark. And by that time, it was dark. And uh, they came back and said, they'll take us, uh, she'll take us in. So uh, <laughs> we uh, trekked all the way back through town, the whole town, to the other side to this woman's home, and we got there about 10 o'clock, and uh, everything was fine. 7.30 next morning, the same thug uh, and maybe some other guys came, and uh, I know this big guy had a hammer tied to each wrist, and as he went through the house, he had a sort of a circular stairway going up with uh, little pictures and stuff, one of which is hanging on the wall out there, uh, and hitting these things that were re irreplaceable. And the last thing he did, he took his hammer and hooked it behind the credenza uh, in the dining room, and it was a shallow cabinet, uh, maybe uh, five foot tall and eight foot wide, sitting on a sideboard and pulled it forward so it fell on top of uh, the dining room table with all the valuable uh, brick bac and plates and things uh, in it. Anyhow, I don't know how we found out and why we figured we could go back to our home in Hochheim, but we did. and. Uh, uh, most of the things of value were stolen, and uh, uh, and some of the other stuff was just uh, uh, damaged. The family albums were on the floor, people walking on them. And uh, uh, anyhow, it was about that time we found out that they used the, the men that they had arrested which were numbered maybe uh, 80 or 90 people, 15 years and up, uh, to clean up uh, after the stuff that was uh, uh, thrown on the streets in the Jewish homes. The idea that there were Jewish businesses that were damaged, uh, uh, that was not part of the picture. This might have been in Berlin or Munich but not in a relatively small town like Worms. But in any case, uh, some of the stuff was uh, in a 
space next to the uh, entrance of our home, including a, a large oil painting of, of my grandmother, of which I have a photograph, with the head cut out. And this disturbed my father no end, as I later found out, because in a letter to a cabinet maker friend uh, about 10 years later, I guess, he said, this is one of the things that I can never forgive. Uh, that cut his mother's head out of the picture. I mean, that was just plain mean. Anyhow, uh, some of the uh, things uh, my father was able to repair, including a little antique box. Uh, my, my brother has that now, it had a secret compartment. But uh, in any case... Uh, what were your thoughts at this time? I, I don't think uh, uh, that stayed. Uh, you, you have to remember, we were not uh, kids that uh, get, got around or get, you know, uh, uh, had a social life. Like uh, kids here, they go to school, they have things after school, they have this and that. Uh, they were more mature than we were. We were kind of sheltered. And uh, I don't know that we ever thought about what was happening or just happening. And uh, we did what needed to be done at that moment, or we thought needed to be done at that moment. But in any case, uh, we uh, uh, gathered up all that we could gather up uh, in our home. Uh, in my aunt's home. I never forget the liver sausage uh, uh, being mixed up with uh, some of the antique stuff that my uncle had. Uh, it was a holy mess in there. But anyway, uh, we uh, gathered the stuff. I don't know how we packed it up or whether we packed it up. But my, my father had a little shop that he, where he did all his work up in, under the attic there. There were undoubtedly uh, 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 Gentile people who helped. Uh, one was uh, Frau Hull, uh, Mrs. Hull. And uh, I, for many years or decades, I described to my wife what a courageous woman she was and how she was vigorous in denouncing the Nazis and all. I had a mouth that big. and. Uh, she was uh, struck uh, uh, dead. I wouldn't say struck dead, but she was flabbergasted that when we finally, when she finally met this woman in 1976, that she was shorter and smaller than my wife. And my wife is not a big woman, but at 86 at that time, she was still full of uh, uh, women vigor. Uh, boy, did I catch myself! Uh, uh, anyhow. What did she do? With, uh, what did she do that was courageous? She spoke out. Well, one main thing. Uh, uh, well, she worked for my mother as long as she could. But uh, during the three weeks that we spent uh, gathering up our stuff uh, at our homes, uh, she supplied us with food. And the way this was done. In front of my aunt's house, there was a little garden that uh, was uh, enclosed with a wall and a door. And behind the door, we dug a hole, maybe a foot in diameter and a foot and a half, two foot deep. And at night, she would deposit the uh, food in there. And that's what we had to eat for three weeks. That took a lot of courage, because anybody saw her, you know. Anyhow, uh, my father came, I don't know whether anything else I should uh, talk about. Uh, my, yeah, we, we packed this uh, stuff up and, uh, and uh, we borrowed uh, from a friend of my parents who had a clothing factory in Worms, a two-wheel commercial type of a, a cart. This may be, uh, it had a platform on it, uh, maybe six foot long, four foot wide, and uh, plus handles. 
and wheels that were as tall as we were, and it was heavy. And we loaded that thing up, and we uh, drove it or pushed it uh, to worms, it's like running a gauntlet. We, you know, it, anything could have happened, but nothing did. But we had been assigned to the home uh, of uh, uh, Doctor uh, Baby Doctor Gansheim was his name. Uh, but he and his wife had committed suicide a couple of months before, maybe two, three months before. And uh, we were assigned by somebody, probably the head of the Jewish uh, congregation, uh, uh, somebody like that. Uh, that's where we would live, and that's where we took the stuff. It was uh, directly uh, across a little square from where the nuns and the priests lived, not together. But in any case, uh, the, the cathedral was on the other side. And the cathedral uh, was done by the same architect that uh, built the uh, synagogue uh, 900 years before. Anyhow, uh, uh, we moved in, and uh, there were other people there that were assigned there. There was a, a school teacher and her mother. The, the mother was able to come to the United States, but they, would, uh, they wouldn't take uh, her daughter. And uh, she was uh, obviously killed. Uh, we had a uh, school friend uh, who uh, uh, used to take uh, dogs for a walk. And the, the dogs he took for a walk belonged to uh, Mrs. Stern. Mrs. Sten uh, and her former uh, dead husband owned a bookstore. And uh, she wouldn't leave Germany without her dogs. And Lutz was his guy's name. He and his sister were homely looking kids. Uh, uh, took these big schnauzers for a walk. We, we call them the Bärenführer, the, the leader of the bears. But in any case, uh, that's the kind of thing that went on, that people didn't, uh, was, didn't prefer to stay with their dogs instead of saving themselves. In any case, uh, uh, one day, I still had my bicycle that I got from my 12th birthday uh, a year before, in 1937 on my 12th birthday, I guess. And uh, it was big uh, balloon tires and fancy. I mean, I was in love with the thing. And that's what I drove uh, a bicycle with. with uh, I used that bicycle to ride to the school. And as I crossed the square in front of the cathedral, one of the neighborhood uh, uh, kids, uh, Martinez was their name, they were known as uh, ruffians. Uh, one of them came up to me and got me off the bicycle and took my bicycle and smashed it on the on the uh, stone surface there. Fortunately, the, the bicycle was of such a quality that I was able to straighten the frame. It, <laughs> if it had been a better quality, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have bent. And, I wouldn't have been able to straighten it. But if you're looking for blood or something that uh, you know uh, happened that would be of interest to an uh, audience that's not familiar with that sort of thing. And that I, youth did it, why? Beg your pardon? He, why did that kid do that? He was the youngest of several brothers and, uh, and uh, they were just ruffians. It's just like they gangs that shoot each other here. And uh, I, that's the reputation they had anyway. One incident, uh, I don't know whether it was at, before or after my father came back from Buchenwald, that's where they took him and my uncle and the rest of them. Uh, my mother came back from the dairy store one day and uh, between her thumb and index finger, she held up an egg. And uh, 
like she won the, the Stanley Cup or uh, she got she got it uh, without giving a ration stamp for it because it was damaged was uh, it was a poker a poker egg and she was ecstatic that she was able to get this egg there anyhow my father got out of uh, Buchenwald how they took him to Buchenwald uh, these people and how they got back I have no idea uh, it must have been the uh, railroads are popular over there uh, things are close together and and the population is very dense so they have no problem getting customers and that's why they have small automobiles and anyhow what was uh, he like when he came home he he, was... he uh, looked like hell i mean he, he was so pale they had shaved his head and uh uh six months later or a year later i got a picture of him and he still looks like it this passport picture looks like it anyhow uh he fixed himself a shop uh in the the doctor's waiting room my father was always busy he, he, he never stopped doing something in any case he he made a bed for me in a night table and uh i don't know what I, and he made uh, three trunks in case uh, his kids would be able to get out of germany maybe he had an idea that we would be able to but uh, mine is sitting downstairs in the lower level you might have noticed it and uh in any case uh in uh about a week later after my dad came home in on december the 16th 1938 my uh, uh, uncle my cousin's father died in buchenwald he had uh, he had uh, asthma uh already during the first world war even though he had asthma he volunteered his services and he he had a severe uh, wound in his leg and so the rest of the war he became a guard at a prisoner of war camp the youngest brother after whom i'm named and whose drawings are hanging on the wall over there he was studying art in in uh, barcelona spain smuggled himself uh, back to germany under an assumed name and i got all the details uh and uh, he was a hemophiliac and uh volunteered you know got back and uh got a head shot near the belgian border and died in december of 1914 in any case uh, uh that's what happened to uh all the members of the immediate family the thing that covers it my father's mother died in 34 and uh uh she was very particular and uh my aunt and uncle lived with the, with her uh between the time that they got married and uh the house was built and it almost drove them crazy uh she would come into their bedroom and make sure that her son's pants were laid out uh, properly so they wouldn't get wrinkled also uh my aunt uh, tells the story that uh uh she when when i was parked with her while my brothers were being born a week or two and uh she complained uh, afterwards that the maid that she sent with me the nanny that she sent with me to my grandmother wasn't clean how come uh, you know she wasn't clean well her wash rag was uh, uh, still dry in the morning check the wash rag that's how she knew she didn't allegedly wash herself and uh, on her dying bed in the hospital she made sure that uh, the bed uh, uh, spread and all that that was straightened out uh, anyway she told my mother she says uh sagen sie schmund 
a son son yates son flam tell sigmund her son he should hold his temper <laughs> uh, i got a brother walter who is quite a bit like him uh, doing skiing and all that sort of thing and cabinet making and he's a technical guy of the family anyhow uh let's go up to the point at which you're in transition coming to america how did that how did those circumstances become well they, uh, my parents took us to frankfurt how we got to frankfurt i don't know it must have been a train but in any case uh, the thing that I remember vividly is that we got on the train and looked out the window at my parents standing on the platform there. My, my father was wearing a, a dark winter coat, heavy coat, and uh, the usual felt hat. My mother was like a turban-like thing with a dark coat. I remember standing up there, out there, looking up at us and us looking at them, uh, neither one knowing whether we'd ever see each other again, which was kind of traumatic. Uh, uh, this was in the, at night, and the next morning we got to Munich, and uh, they assembled us and uh, with uh, the other kids in our children's transport, they call it, uh, in the uh, home of a doctor again, in the waiting room, I guess. And I know uh, I was tired and uh, we rested, uh, but I I conked out, I think. I uh, lost consciousness. I, anyway, I was out of it. But my grandmother's sister lived there, and she came to uh, take a sightseeing in Munich. She went to, uh, there's a lot to see in Munich. And uh, all I know is I don't remember her, uh, uh, what she looked like or what, how she acted, but she took us out on the street and said, we're going to that car. And that car was a, uh, looked like a, a Model T, maybe a pre-World War I thing. That's all I remember. Was, uh, it was a real old-fashioned thing. Anyway, I don't remember seeing anything, doing anything. We was were just, early 1939? No, uh, April of 40. April of 40, okay. Yeah, uh, April, uh, well, it might have been May, uh, the end of March because we arrived in St. Louis on April the 13th. But in any case, uh, we then uh, discovered that uh, my brother's John's passport didn't have the, what was they, what they called Sistramag, a, a large J, a red J with a date on it. And, uh, oh, he's not going to get across the border. Oh, this is going to be terrible. And uh, I don't know what they did, but they mobilized all everybody and anything to see whether they could do something about that. In any case, uh, we got on the train and... Uh, this was in the evening, and uh, the critical point was uh, going across uh, the Brenner Pass, which is a well-known uh, thing that goes across the Alp. And the uh, German Border Patrol came on board and uh, to check the passports and all that. But uh, the guy either, the guy that checked our car either didn't care or was careless, but there was no problem. Uh, he just uh, went through there and uh, didn't pass. Oh, okay. Well, uh, in any case, uh, that overcame one hurdle, and uh, the train went on. We came through Milan. We saw the famous uh, cathedral in the distance, and we uh, got to Genoa, uh, according, according to the guy who saw in my daughter's thing. There must have been 12 or 15 of us. In any case, we got to Genoa. All I remember is uh, that they marched us up this little narrow street up the hill into a place where they had a big round table 
must have been a small restaurant or somebody's uh, uh, great room or something. Anyhow, this woman brings out a, a dinner plate, a big dinner plate with spaghetti and meatball, all for us? Well, uh, he says, yeah, each one of you got one of these. You know, Our stomachs were about that big and uh, we couldn't begin to eat half of what they served and we never saw so much food in years. And uh, anyhow, eventually uh, they marched us down to the harbor where we got on the large Italian pla uh, passenger liner, the Conde di Savoia. Uh, one episode on the train through Italy, uh, I sat next to a good looking gentleman. He had some kind of a uniform. He gave me his uh, card, his business card, whatever it was. He was uh, an officer in the Italian neighbor or army. I still have the card. But anyway, that was uh, one thing. And uh, we got on the boat, and uh, that's to our horror, we found out that uh, we were going to eat in a separate room kosher food. And kosher food to us meant, ah, you know, uh, anyhow. We lived through that and uh, through uh, seasickness and all that. But before that, uh, we stopped in Naples. We saw Vesuvius in the distance and uh, there were some, uh, some naval ships in the harbor. Beautiful sight. And then uh, the next stop was in Gibraltar. Uh, and I guess some kind of patrol boat or something. Came out. I mean, the war had started. This was right. 1940. You're, you're taking this passage at a time of war. Yeah. What did you notice about the war at that point? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. No. So you're no. in Gibraltar? Gibraltar had stopped there, and the patrol boat came on, and uh, they did their shtick their thing, and uh, we landed at uh, Pier 46 in New York, and they took us to a hotel where our uh, relatives and friends uh, came uh, earlier. Uh, my brother John, uh, we, we didn't know where we were going to go. We didn't know. We never heard of St. Louis. New York maybe, Chicago maybe, Los Angeles maybe, but not St. Louis. Anyhow, uh, my brother John started crying. He, he was uh, uh, how old? Uh, 40, he was 14 years old. And uh, why, why are you upset? And he said, oh, I'm afraid of the Indians and all that and the Wild West and the shooting and all that. And, and my former schoolmate said, don't worry about it. They have a wonderful baseball team there. And, uh, and uh, they have streetcars and it's a very nice city. Don't worry about it. But in any case, uh, we eventually, uh, I guess uh, that next day or whatever, uh, got on the train, for, for a Pullman train uh, to St. Louis, including the fellow, including uh, another fellow from uh, Germany who had a brother in Chicago. He took the train with us to uh, St. Louis, and he went on to Chicago to his brother. Uh, in the morning, uh, we had uh, breakfast in the dining room, I mean the dining car, and uh, the next table across the aisle from us, people were eating wood shavings, or at least that's what it looked to us. That's the first time we uh, saw uh, cornflakes. Anyhow, how much did you know about America before you arrived, and what did you think once you got here? We had a, uh, besides studying English, which we couldn't speak, even after three years of studying it, uh, we, we eventually got a book, a small, thin book, uh, Our America, or something like that was the title, and it, it had uh, idioms and uh, description of the peculiarities of uh, 
and we got some idea from that. Uh, I don't recall that I got anything out of it, but uh, in any case, uh, we did what uh, we were supposed to do and, uh, and go where we were supposed to go. And we had uh, Mrs. Esrock from St. Louis as a chaperone on the, on the train. Who was contacted on the American side to look after you or to be a host family? How was that established? Uh, the Joint Distribution Committee uh, 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 was the uh, manager, or the uh, it's under their auspices. Uh, this was all arranged. Uh, uh, I I don't know the, the I don't know how our trunk uh, with our uh, possessions uh, how it got to from Worms. Uh, to Munich or on the boat or the United States anyway. Uh, How much did you have with you? What we were fit in that trunk. One trunk. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, and ten marks, which was worth four dollars. Wow. Anyhow, uh, uh, we uh, were taken to uh, an Esrock family. It was a couple, I guess, on uh, 2300 uh, North Euclid here in St. Louis. And they, they owned a grocery store. And uh, I remember him bringing home an orange crate, uh, about a foot square and two, two and a half foot long, with groceries. Never saw, we never saw so much food in our, in, in our memory. In any case, uh, we lived there for a week and it was 84 degrees in, uh, in uh, April. We landed at, uh, on April 26th in St. Louis. And uh, uh, one day, Mrs. Garfinkel, my foster mother, arrived. I remember looking down and she was sitting there. She was a very prim woman. Very, very chic, uh, you know, fur coat and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, getting back, it was 84 degrees. I said, we're going to die here. Yeah, this, 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 this is uh, terrible. And uh, all they said, oh, you haven't seen anything yet. It gets a lot hotter here. This, this, we're going to cook. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I... Uh, I was uh, assigned to, uh, or taken in by Mr. and Mrs. Garfinkel, Leo and Bess Garfinkel. Her family owned uh, Star Furniture. They had a store on Grand Avenue in Hartford and down on Broadway. They, that, her family had the money. He didn't. But in any case, uh, I should don't. You better cut that out. Somebody might see that. See that. Anyway, uh, they were in their early forties. And uh, to us, that was pretty old. Uh, to me, it was. Now my youngest child is 46. But anyway, uh, I lived them with them for a year. And uh, the first experience I had, the first day I was there, uh, she sent me with uh, some of the neighborhood kids to the Forest Park. It was, uh, they, their apartment was at 6314 South Rosebury which is a block and a half from the park. And they g she gave us a long sandwiches. The first thing that one of those kids did, she, uh, he, he took the ham out of, out of the sandwich and threw it in the street. I mean, to throw food away was, a, was a, something that flabberg was flabbergasting, that they would do that. But it indicated that they had more than enough to eat. Uh, and uh, within a week, I started going to Wydown School on uh, Wydown Avenue. It's a junior high or middle school. And uh, in any case, uh, I sat there and all I heard was blah, 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 blah. I couldn't understand the word they were saying. But during the three summer months, I learned enough English so that uh, I made pretty good grades starting in September. 
wasn't, wasn't perfect, but uh, it was good enough. I could understand uh, what they were, was being said and what was being wanted, what the ins assignment wants. During the summertime, I made a little money. Uh, Pepsi Cola, uh, one of the soda companies, would give kids uh, a cooler on, on little wheels, about so big. And uh, I had an assortment of sodas in there. And I uh, went up and down the street, uh, orange, lemon, Dr. Pepper, I would holler, and people came out and maybe bought a, a bottle of soda for a nickel. And I got to keep maybe a penny of that. In any case... Uh, While you were in St. Louis in those early months, did you have any contact with your parents? Yes, we uh, uh, corresponded by mail, and I have... Uh, uh, two pouches of uh, letters that uh, I received from them. And what did you want to tell me about your father and the new temple in Worms? Well, uh, when he got back from uh, Buchenwald in uh, mid-December, uh, as I mentioned uh, a little earlier, he fixed himself up a shop in the, in the Dr. Gensheim's uh, waiting room. And... Uh, uh, two things that he did uh, during that time, he uh, uh, he was given the job, or he took the job, of uh, repairing the Torah scrolls. When we got to the temple on Kristallna, they were spread out on the street, and there were tire marks all over the holy parchments. Anyway, they, and they were torn, stuff like that. And he took the job of repairing, which he did once before in 1923, uh, documented by a document that I have. And uh, the other thing he did in uh, one of the rooms of the community building where, that, where our school, Jewish school was, uh, only this was on the second floor, uh, he built a new temple. And uh, I got pictures downstairs, and, and he, he, he gave him a testimonial, and beautifully done, but uh, they got a mistake in there. They repeated the word twice. Anyway, uh, he did that, and uh, uh, what else did he do? In any case, it was about a week or ten days after he got out of Buchenwald, we got word that his brother had died there. And uh, I never forget, there was a, a landing between the first and second floor of this home, uh, maybe about ten foot by three or four foot. And he, with his hands behind his, clasped behind his back, he bent back and forth like a wounded bear in the Sioux. He was pale, you know, and uh, it uh, really bothered him. And that's how he, uh, I guess, tranquilized himself. Uh, and, uh, he, I could see him walking back and forth with his head down and hands behind his back. Uh, that was quite an experience. I, you know, my father was allegedly a strong person, a strong personality, and to have him be... Uh, uh, discompobulated like that uh, was uh, something that was impress in, uh, impressive, uh, impressive for me, on me. Anyhow, uh, so my, you... brothers, oh, please. my brothers uh, were taken in by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lohenhaupt, uh, uh, Bessie and uh, Abe Lohenhaupt very prominent people here. Uh, he died in 58. Anyway, he was a big time tax lawyer downtown, so was his son. And uh, he had uh, five children. Uh, one of the others, the other son was a scientist. Uh, he was way up there, I mean, really. Uh, he he uh, was working on uh, the uh, connection between the uh, the nerve parts, uh, how that worked in England, so far, and then he was, a, had, I don't know, maybe three or four PhDs, 
And uh, then he became a professor at Ithaca University. Anyway, up there, married a Chinese woman with a very intelligent girl. The whole family very talented. But in any case, uh, uh, with his influence, uh, uh, they were able to. He was able to arrange for my parents to come to the United States via the Trans-Siberian Railroad, the Vladivostok, Vladivostok, and Yokohama, and so forth and so on. But before that came about, they were able to arrange for them to uh, uh, come through France. Occupied France, I guess, and uh, Spain, Portugal, and uh, in Lisbon they got on the boat. The Excalibur was the name of the boat, and it was a small boat. It took them two weeks to get to New York, and we finally uh, uh, picked them up at Union Station on April the 13th, to the uh, one year to the very day that. Uh, they said goodbye to us in Frankfurt the year before. What was that reunion like? It was traumatic, uh, you know. It was, I mean, we knew that they were coming, so it wasn't something that came out of the blue. But uh, my father uh, got a job right away nailing uh, cove moldings uh, down at uh, uh, Sticks. Uh, Rice Sticks was the name on the 10th in Washington. Made a dollar and a quarter an hour, which was uh, tremendous. That was big time uh, money. And uh, then he, uh, he, for a number of years during the war, he worked for Warfield shops on Euclid Antique Store. He had a, they had, they had a shop for him. Uh, a little further north, and there he restored uh, antique furniture. I mean, that chair over there is one piece that is restored. That chair is about 240 years old. Anyhow, uh, uh, he, he was stubborn, and uh, he got into hassles with them ever so often, but they needed him. Anyway, uh, after that, he worked uh, for uh, Larry Ruth. Do you know who Larry Ruth was? He was uh, uh, president of the Federal Reserve here, and uh, uh, subsequently county supervisor. Uh, Charlie something or other is, is that now. But in any case, uh, they started a furniture a woodworking thing down on Hickory and and uh, Sevens or something like that uh, down near downtown on Hickory and Sevens. But anyway, they needed somebody, and uh, they uh, they were able to buy some wood. And uh, but they only had a guy from who uh, worked for uh, Curtis Wright here, and my father always mentioned that he had a slide rule, and he made the drawings. But he was used to working with metal that didn't shrink or, uh, or swell. So by the time he got the drawings made, the wood had already uh, <laughs> uh, took it, taken on a different shape. In any case, uh, that didn't last very long because uh, uh, they just couldn't hack it. They couldn't make anything. Uh, but in any case, in uh, 46, after I got out of the service, and I'll come back to my service experience. Uh, uh, Abe Lonehopped helped us to buy a, a small woodworking place on Morgan Ford in Utah in June the 6th, uh, 1946. And uh, we had one employee, he had only two fingers on one hand. All these old cabinet guys, uh, they, sooner or later, they cut off some of their fingers. And anyhow. Uh, Let's go to your, you yourself, uh, as a student, you're, you're about 15, 16. Uh, went to Wydown School and uh, 
for one year, and then uh, when my parents came, I moved in with them. We lived at uh, 5174 Enright Avenue, down the street from the old YMHA on Union. And uh, uh, what we were talking about. Well, let me ask you. No, the same thing. Let me continue. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the next two years, I went to uh, Hadley Technical School, studying aircraft and aircraft engine mechanics. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, in July 40, 43, I went into the Soviet U.S. Army. And uh, instead of uh, putting me in the Air Corps, where I could have been of some use because of my schooling, they put me in the Signal Corps. And I was in the Signal Corps throughout the 33 month I was in the service. I was first in Oregon, uh, the 70th Division, and they transported us uh, to uh, Camp Carter near Joplin, Missouri, New Osho. And we were there. This was the Signal Corps camp, and we studied uh, wiring and uh, telephone and all that kind of stuff. And we were part of a company, 70% were uh, nationalist Chinese. And one of the things we had to do was climb telephone poles. If you know what that is, with the iron strapped to the inside of your leg with a spike on the bottom, and you walk up the poles, and you, you see all these slivers and sticking out figuring you're going to slide down and get all these slivers in your stomach. I remember this one Chinese, he was old. He was must have been 30 or 35 years old. He just lay down at the bottom of this pole and he said, I'm not going up there. Anyhow, uh, from there, uh, we went to uh, uh, Rhode Island in a camp, uh, staging camp for going overseas and uh, we were there for three weeks and we were not supposed to talk to anybody or go any place but uh, uh, I saw my first uh, hockey game in Providence and I never seen one I think maybe seen one since and uh, then uh, one I remember going to Boston to Scully Square to the old Howard theater and uh, it was a, a burlesque theater uh, where at that time when we visited there went to, to that place Lily Sincere was her name got her start as a stripper but in any case uh, in camp I like to argue religion with the, some people uh, that are our challenge and there was a uh, a uh, young, he wasn't a priest, but he was studying for it. And we s uh, sat across the bunk from each other and we went at it uh, discussing. Anyway, we finally uh, got on the boat, which was, uh, uh, used to be the America, and they ch changed the name of it. It was a big boat. And uh, our company was assigned to do kitchen duty. Our whole battalion was, because there were two and a half thousand people, uh, soldiers on that boat. And uh, I know my job was, uh, there were two lines, uh, feeding lines, and uh, I was uh, in charge of, dish, uh, of dishing out the coffee. There was a tub about a foot and a half tall and about two and a half, three foot wide. And I had a big scupper, and as they came by, I uh, dumped uh, the coffee into their mess kit or whatever uh, cup. That uh, took about 10 days or two weeks. We landed in Liverpool. They took us to Hereford uh, in Wales. And during the three weeks we were in England, uh, there was a half a day when, when there wasn't fog and rain and uh, the sun came out for half a day. Anyway, we went down, uh, we went to this camp. It was, was formerly a, 
a place where they uh, parked the uh, kids from London uh, during the blitz. And uh, the beds were about five foot long with a straw sack on them. And that's what we slept on. And I, I, me at five and a half foot tall, barely, uh, wasn't so bad, but we had guys who were six and a half foot tall and their feet would stick out and it was only so wide. So anyhow, uh, uh, I acquired a can of uh, Spam, which I took to France with me. And we went down to Portsmouth or Southampton. We caught an Indian boat from India, uh, freighter, and uh, yeah, all the all the sailors were five foot or less. So they were little guys, but they made them uh, scrub the desk with the uh, pumice stone, a big piece of rock and that's what they did and uh, they uh, we were fed out of uh, like a big trash can we go and buy there and, and they dump the stuff in there and one of the guys said they claimed that he, he got a prophylactic thing uh, in his in his stew I mean it was slop I mean you, like you feed the pigs you know <laughs> Anyway, the, it was a stormy uh, time, a very stormy. We got across, but uh, there, were, there, there was no place for the boat to, to anchor we, and uh, to land because of the storm. And uh, we were on that boat for two or three days, and uh, it was rough. In any case, uh, we were disembarked via uh, landing craft, which were flat bottom things about, uh, I'd say, 30 foot wide, certainly wider than this room is long, maybe one and a half times, and twice as long. And uh, they would haul off 800 of us on each trip that they made. and. Uh, those flat bottom things, uh, you know, when, when they bounce on off the top of the waves, that was quite a thing, particularly because they had a stairway hanging on the side of the boat that we had to go down uh, with all of our pack, everything we owned, our weapons and all that, and that thing would swing back and forth. The 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 the, the landing craft would sometimes smash into the boat and then uh, separate. Uh, I know that uh, at least three guys uh, intermittently fell in between. They fished them out just in time. But anyway, uh, my friend Chet Bossert from Pennsylvania, he had Rusty here, he uh, said, Chet, we're not going to bounce around in this thing for hours while they load. 800 guys, one at a time, going down that ladder, you know. And then when they get on shore, uh, it was rainy. It was a bad, bad thing. And they're going to be parked out there on the, on the shore uh, uh, for hours. Well, they got one, one load off. They got two load off. We were hiding between the lifeboat. And then on the last load, when, the, when the, the French officials that had been in England uh, were let off, we got on. And we got uh, to shore, and there was a, a big convoy of trucks. And wherever we're going, uh, I said, Chet, we want to be one of the first to get there. So we headed for a, t a truck in the front. And we got to this uh, uh, field near Hafleur, which is a few miles from there. Uh, and uh, it was freshly turned over with a plow. I mean, first that, that deep and wet. But I spotted a, a little island, maybe uh, five foot, four or five foot wide and six foot long with willows on it. Said Chet, we're gonna 
put our uh, pup tent onto that thing. And we did, and we dug a little channel around the outside so the water wouldn't flow in. Anyway, by that time it was dark, and uh, I remember getting into that my sleeping bag with my Mackinac on and wool, wool nut, knit cap, and it was cold, it was November. And uh, I got in there and I had a call of nature. I was no sooner in there. I got out of everything again, went up the hill a little bit where they had a, what they call a slit trench. If you know what that is, about so wide, and as long as, uh, as it takes to accommodate a lot of people. And uh, I did my business, went back, and uh, at what time is it? Look, no watch. I lost my watch. And uh, I wasn't ever gonna, you know, if I trapped it in that slit trench, let it be buried alive, you know. In any case, uh, we uh, were there, and then uh, we uh, were hauled to Le Havre, where we were assigned to run the telephone central, which consisted of a couple of field switchboards, which had the the, the cords coming up, and you, uh, when somebody called, the little li little lid fell down that covered the hole and uh, it would come up and you stuck the thing in there and it's, how can I help you? And uh, then you took the other card and connected them. But there was only 50 of these, but there were 150 telephones hooked up uh, to that. And uh, uh, sometimes we couldn't answer the, they, they kept ringing and uh, we didn't, we out of cards, you know. How long did you do that for the army? Uh, I think we were there three months, maybe. What happened then? Then we were taken to Lille, which is uh, near the Belgian border, and uh, there they had uh, late type uh, switchboards. Thanks, so. and we we were the uh, switching uh, central between Shave and and the headquarters in uh, Comsi in Paris and Second Army Corps, uh, General, uh, what was his name? Uh, he was always in a fight with uh, Eisenhower and Bradley. And and, Patton? Uh, no, Patton was our guy. Yeah. Oh. This was a Britisher. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I'll think of it anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, we were there for several months, including uh, to the time of the bulge, as you may call that. Some of our, uh, I mean, we uh, were afraid that they, they were gonna have parachute, guys parachute into town, you know, particularly to communication places like ours. So uh, we were on duty at the switchboard for eight hours, then we, uh, would walk guard uh, back when we had little car, car, carbines, you know, the little pea shooters, the little 38 millimeter bullets. <laughs> uh, but that's all we needed as a signal corps, you know, back, walking back and forth, back and forth. Anyhow, uh, we did that for three days. And then, uh, uh, after that, uh, they they had girls there from uh, Algiers, from Oran, and uh, anyway, uh, they transferred us to Quiquedon, Camp Quiquedon, near Rennes on Brittany Peninsula, and we ran the switchboard there, the communication thing, and uh, and uh, but on the way there, we happened to uh, uh, miss the train. We, for two days in Paris. And uh, we got to see a lot of pa uh, Paris during that time. Uh, Eiffel Tower, and at the Eiffel Tower, uh, a Frenchman came and uh, took our photograph and uh, got money from us. 
but never showed up with the pictures. Was this still Nazi-occupied Paris? No, no, no. This was in November of, this was in uh, uh, middle 45, I would oh. think. Yeah, they were, our guys were across Remag and Bridge and into so and so. Okay, so by this time the war is over. No, it's no. not over. It was, it was, it was for all practical purposes, it was won. And uh, I know uh, uh, we used uh, prisoner of war for kitchen duty, and they they were, they would dish out the food. And I know one guy talked to me. He somehow he knew I understood German. He said, "You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't should have should not have stopped at the Elb, or shouldn't stop at the Elb. You should go on uh, into Russia and chase those guys back because." Those guys are worse than we are for German, you know, the, the innocent people, worse than we are. But uh, the Russians killed like three million of them, uh, prisoners of war. Have you had any knowledge yet about what Nazism was perpetrating upon Jews and others with the Holocaust? Or did that come, that knowledge come after the war? Well, my... Uh, uh, my father's brother died in Buchenwald. My father was there. My mother's brother, Heinrich, uh, he, he could have gotten out of Germany, but he stayed to take care of his mother. But he and uh, his uh, fellow male Jews in Memming, and there was 87 of them, they hauled him off. Uh, I got a postcard he wrote from Lublin. He must have bribed somebody. And... Uh, it is a very, very interesting document uh, uh, because it had, what, she, what he wrote had a lot of secondary meanings. Uh, the address that he sent it to, uh, the, he omitted the exact address to protect the recipient. Anyhow, uh, after the war, a cousin of my mother's, who uh, also was married to a Gentile woman, they, was, they stayed there during the war. In the last four months, they uh, had this uh, guy who was in the uh, uh, clothing manufacturing business uh, working the sawmill. He had to go and ride a bicycle to the sawmill every day, run the gauntlet. But he was a little guy, you know. He was about uh, like uh, he was about as suitable to work in. The, so I mean, as, as, a, as a two-year-old. But in any case, uh, we got a letter, or my, my mother's sister got a letter from him, a couple of them, and he uh, told the story of what had happened uh, during the war, and uh, some of the stuff in there is pretty raw. But uh, his brother... Uh, his brother's daughter lives in San Diego. She just broke her foot and she's 86 years old. And her husband is 94 and he, he's about to go. But uh, they uh, sent uh, their their parents east. I mean, they were in their 70s and old people. They, they haul them off to, to, to the concentration camp in Poland. Uh, my grandmother's sister, who took a sightseeing in Munich, she uh, committed suicide in uh, in uh, uh, 1942. She wasn't about to be deported. Uh, I got a long uh, diary from my grandmother, and that that was very illuminating. What she wrote. Uh, one point of interest, uh, going very back. They couldn't marry until the older sister got married first. She had to wait until her older. Anyhow, uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. Well, let's go to the uh, to the end of the war. Where were you when the Second we, World uh, War was? We, we were sh shipped back. Uh, we were about to go and uh, be shipped to, uh, to the uh, Pacific uh, War. But before that happened, uh, that was over. And uh, we were sent back to uh, the United States and uh, had three weeks of furlough. And then I was stationed uh, 
at Fort Mamas, New Jersey, which was a Signal Corps base, and uh, and uh, in uh, Camp Edison, which was a satellite camp, and Camp Wood. Uh, in uh, Camp Edison, I learned how to drive. Uh, we had a storm uh, coming in, a hurricane or a t whatever it was, was a, the waves were way high and flooded uh, a lot of places. And uh, a couple of my buddies and I went down to the coast. It was right on the coast to see the waves come in. And then on the way back, we passed the motor pool. And uh, the water was about a foot and a half high where we were walking. So we went up to where uh, the trucks were parked. And I got into one of the trucks. And uh, no sooner was I in there, why uh, the door opens and this guy says, take it up to the parade count. He says, I don't know how to drive. He says, well, you turn a switch right here, that turns it on. This is the clutch, this is the brake. This is where you give it gas. And this is where you put it in gear. There's one thing he didn't mention. Uh, uh, in those days, maybe still today, you have to double clutch to go from one gear to the other. You know about that? Anyhow, uh, I started out down the street, down to uh, near where the bay was and on the way up, but I couldn't get it out of first gear. The damn thing got hot. I mean, uh, those that, that first gear was so low, you know, that in order to go 10 miles an hour, that engine had to go about 25, 3,500 RPM. And in those days, they weren't built like they were today. Got up to the parade ground, and the guy was going like this. He was, there was a row of trucks, and there was a space between, uh, there was a space there where they, the row, and they said, one in there. Is you crazy? I got a, this uh, humongous truck, and you want me to put this into this little, little bit? I figure, well, if he thinks I can get it in there, uh, why, I'll give it a whack. And uh, <laughs> I did drive it in there, it did fit in there. And, and how do you stop this thing now? I just turned off the, the switch. They didn't have keys, they had a little switch that you turned and of course the engine stopped, it was still in gear, so it, uh, it was okay, that was my first driving experience. But uh, in Camp Wood, which was subsequent, was it Camp Wood? Well anyway, uh, we, we had the KP duty, there were 800 officers there, and uh, I was in charge of uh, do, uh, lately uh, doing the hot cakes and the eggs, and I had guys uh, uh, breaking eggs uh, all the time in the, in the bowls and I put them on this griddle about six foot or eight foot long and a foot and a half wide. By the time I got to this end, the, the, the eggs were done on that end. Same way for the hot cakes. But in any case, uh, I subsequently uh, got to the uh, prisoner of war camp in in uh, Fort Monmouth. And uh, there I was interpreter and uh, postal clerk and uh, and uh, that's about it. Oh, and I taught class to the German prisoners, uh, English and history. I had I'd been to the United States already three or four, by that time, five years, you know. And uh, what did I know about history? Anyway, I told them everything I knew, and, but the first three weeks I was mess sergeant. They didn't have any a mess sergeant, and uh, so I had them clean up the place. And these guys uh, were KP and other places, and they had a way of scrounging uh, food. And I know that they came back. Uh, there was a piece of. Uh, What do you make a hamburger uh, about so square and about four foot long? I mean, it weighed a hundred pounds or more, and they came back with that. 
anyway, that and we had a guy by the name of Taylor from Mississippi. He had a 65 IQ, and he was a mean SOB. And uh, I got into a hassle with him, and he would come into the office, and I'd behind my desk. But I had the poker from the from the oven next to me. I don't, he had a head that was flat on top, and I don't know whether it would have hurt him any if I hit him. But there was one guy there, and he was mean. And another guy who was a, a academic, a high IQ, but not very practical. But these, for a 19-year-old, was quite an experience. What did you notice of Germany? This is your, you're back in Germany, you're originally... No, 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 France. Oh, you're in France. England okay, and France. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, what did you do after the army? Well, uh, I goofed off for about uh, three or four weeks. I got out uh, in April or late April, and uh, as I mentioned before, in June the 6th, we started this, this business. We bought a place uh, called Forecraft Manufacturing Company at Morgan Ford in Utah in South St. Louis. They made uh, uh, boxes for silverware. They uh, made out of cypress, uh, which wasn't a very good wood, but that's all you could get. And they would flock the inside. You know what flocking is? You know what velvet looks like? Well, the velvet has little bitty fibers that are stuck to cloth, makes it nice and soft. And, well, anyway, uh, uh, we would spray the inside of these boxes uh, with some kind of a clue or something. And then we, we'd spray that clue with this f called flock, called flocking, and ma made it look like it was lined with uh, velvet. But uh, that was a hell of a mess. And uh, how long did you have that company? You were forty-three years. Okay. And uh, anyhow, there was no lumber to be had. But uh, we bought all the lumber that uh, Larry Ruth's uh, company had after they closed down, where my dad worked. It was a uh, terrible stuff. Uh, sycamore was sycamore is not useful for almost anything. Anyhow. And uh, I had an opportunity to buy a bunch of uh, cypress that was cut in s small pieces that was to be sent down to Puerto Rico to make uh, uh, whatever it takes to, to raise honeybees. Uh, they put the things in there. And, but in, uh, uh, we, for one of the big, first big jobs we did was uh, make uh, dental display cases. How Howard Oldendorf was a big shot in uh, local Republican circles, and he had an orthodontic laboratory in Gravois and Grand, and uh, uh, he needed uh, display cases so deep, and maybe uh, two and a half foot long and two foot tall. So we made those. So there was no packing material. We, we uh, hand carried them uh, on a truck and uh, put blankets or whatever in between and took it over to his place down in the basement. But in any case, uh, we also uh, uh, made uh, record cabinets for Artifone. Artifone was the uh, distributor for Philco, which was one of the big brands, the big four, Philco, RCA, General Electric, and uh, Motorola, I believe. Anyway, uh, we hauled those over there without, without any packing. And uh, then uh, uh, there was uh, the uh, NBC was going to open up a television station here, KSD Television. There was no television at that time. And uh, uh, but uh, the NBC took the equipment away from them, put it, 
took it to New York as, as the first NBC television station. And we got we got the second one in St. Louis. So people start buying televisions. They were in, in those days they had a three stage distribution system, manufacturer, distributor, dealer, and then to the consumer. Anyhow, uh, the radio distributors became also television distributors, and we had a couple of calls from in answer to Yellow Book ads. Uh, can you uh, make me a, a stand or a cabinet that I can put my television on? It's uh, uh, too heavy and too big for anything I can buy. So uh, that's when my father made that cabinet that you see downstairs. That was the first television stand in the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Well, there were no other places that had television except New York. And in, in any case, uh, uh, I went, I, I wrote to all the radio manufacturers uh, I the distributors in St. Louis, Philco, Motorola, etc., Zenith, General Electric. Got a response from General Electric, so I headed down there on Locust Street where they had their, their uh, offices and talked to uh, Ralph Lemon was the guy's name. And uh, he said, we got these t TVs, we need a stand there, for something to put them on. I got an order for 24 pieces, and uh, we thought that this was, this was a humongous thing, uh, 24 stands. Anyway, uh, we made those, and then for, for subsequent models, and uh, I contacted the Kansas City distributor, Omaha, Louisville, and uh, gradually it spread. Uh, I had sold to almost all the General Electric distributors uh, stands we made. I had a three-ring binder with uh, with the pictures of the uh, Leonard, uh, of of those first uh, stands, and uh, I lent it to uh, our advertising sales promotion manager, and he either lost it or whatever he he did with it. Maybe he gave it to one of my brothers and never saw it again, so I don't have pictures of that. Knowing that your archive is so huge, let me ask you how you obtained the, the volumes and volumes of artifacts, photos, marriage records, it's genealogies. Let's so, talk about that a little bit. It's a lot of work. Yes. How did you come into possession of all of that artifactual material? Well, there was a professor at Rosenthal who did a uh, Gustav genealogy in 1923, and I got a copy of that. And it's a very interesting thing that uh, the Holocaust Museum might want to know. I, I translated it, and it might be one of the documents that uh, uh, they might want to display. And uh, in any case, what got me started, and I, I, that's the title of one of the uh, preambles in my genealogy. Uh, after my father died, I got a, I got his library, his uh, correspondence, his documents, and amongst those was a letter written by Simon Oppenheimer from uh, Fremont, Ohio, to his cousins in Worms, and. Uh, that intrigued me. The other thing that uh, contributed to my getting started is uh, it wasn't just that six million Jews were uh, killed in the concentration camps. The rest of them were either damaged physically or mentally or emotionally and spread throughout the world. Israel, Chile, Colombia, United States, you name it, Canada and so forth and so on. And uh, I thought if I could do something to bring the whole thing back together again in some fashion, I would uh, try to do that. And I collected uh, the information from relatives who were still alive in those days, 
And uh, ever so often somebody would do a genealogy or uh, make a record. There was a Rabbi Malcolm Stern in New York who uh, was the guy who ha was the, so to speak, genealogist of, of, uh, the, of the United States Jews. And he had a student who uh, did a family tree of the Oppenheimers, which was a part of my family, my uh, uh, great-grandfather's mother was an Oppenheimer. So was my grandmother's sister-in-law an Oppenheimer. And uh, Oppenheimer is, is the most popular German-Jewish family name. It's like Smith and Johnson and so forth and Kennedy. Anyhow, uh, uh, there are also uh, uh, records, uh, marriage records, death, death certificates, birth certificates, birth certificates, which uh, uh, name the fathers, where they were born, where they came from, and so forth. In New York, New York Library, I got uh, the manifest of the ship uh, uh, Alabama that my great grandfather's youngest brother came over on in 1845 listed 239 names, and he signed for them in, La, in Havre, not La Havre, but Havre uh, in those days, for 239 people, and he uh, got, got it documented in New York that he delivered 239. So uh, there, there, were, there were, he listed, and, uh, and uh, some friends, it, it eventually comes together. There aren't that many Jewish people, you know. So, uh, 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 I knew that uh, from uh, that letter from 1897 that uh, my great-grandfather's three brothers who grew to adulthood uh, ended up in Fremont, Ohio. Uh, uh, Abe and in 1848, and the other two in 1851 or three, or something like that. And uh, one of them has an extensive family that is still uh, percolating. Uh, one, of, one of their distant relatives uh, is actually living here in St. Louis. But, uh, uh, you know what, I'm wondering if we should uh shoot a, a few shots in the in the archives downstairs. Yeah, I mean, kind of get them talking about it, we'll just leave the microphone on them. And yeah, right. And uh, Leo, uh, my great-grandfather's uh, next, uh, next youngest guy, my great-grandfather was born in 1812 and he was born in 1813. Uh, I got a, a, a picture of an oil painting of him and his son. They have a long, they, they, they're in Selma, Alabama, and so forth. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, Assistant Secretary of State under Statinius and a prominent lawyer in Washington, D.C. It's a, it's a big thing. I've gotten so deep into this that sometimes I feel I'm living in this area, you know? Oh, the other thing, uh, uh, in Fremont, Ohio, which, uh, which is the birthplace of uh, President Hayes, uh, my, uh, one of the uh, Gustavs, uh, Saul Gustav, was a uh, school pal of uh, Berkshire Hayes, the president's son at Harvard Law School, and I got a couple of letters from him and so forth. And, uh, Leopold, the one uh, that has the big family, he started the gas works there and was the president of the gas works. And uh, Abe bought a piece of land there in 1853 and built a house on it, which today is the school board uh, housed in it. Yeah. And could you explain yeah, this uh, family tree? Uh, the oldest guy up there is Abe Khan. And he and the subsequent and his son and grandson and great grandson are all rabbis 
and uh, uh, my mother's family is a, a descendant of that. He is the first uh, high point of which my mother's maiden name. And uh, uh, this is uh, my great grandmother, the one that was pregnant uh, uh, 17 times. And because of that, uh, yeah, my mother had uh, 39 first cousins. Four of those uh, uh, 17 kids died as infants, but all the others lived, and that's where all these people come from. I had to break it up because otherwise it would have been 24 foot long here. How did you come into possession of all of this knowledge? <laughs> uh, a, one of uh, my mother's second cousins, he, he had a tree in, in L.A. He, he, uh, my daughter lives in his house. Uh, he, di he died at a one, uh, age 100. And uh, uh, people periodically made trees, and I, I just gathered them up as I could. And uh, I got about all that I uh, need or can get. I am not interested in getting any more information. You have so much. You're the family historian, I'm sure. You might call it that. How does it make you feel to be the bearer of all of this knowledge? Like I got a concrete color around my neck. Which one? Uh, he was married twice, had uh, three kids by his first marriage and 18 by the second marriage, but only one of them grew uh, uh, to adulthood and had family and descendants. A staff of librarians to help you. Yeah, well, is it my, my wife? There is again. This is my great grandmother, Carolina Heilbrunner, married a Heilbrunner. They were not related. But she's the one that uh, uh, had, uh, was pregnant 17 times. She used to stay in bedroom when they had company because she was embarrassed because she was pregnant again. She was pregnant constantly. Actually, I have a niece who had a, who had a, uh, a son when, when, he, when she was 46 years old last year. Uh, I think this would be of great historical interest, particularly to people who are uh, big on uh, Judaism and so forth. This is the way I used to do the genealogy before I, uh, before I uh, put everything on a computer. And uh, uh, over here is uh, the uh, Maharal, the uh, uh, famous uh, 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 Jewish, uh, he, he was a chief rabbi of Germany and he became uh, uh, an assistant or uh, cabinet minister of the King of Austria and so forth. And so he was, he was an all-around scholar and uh, three of his uh, uh, descendants are the Bachara rabbis. Uh, Samuel, Abraham, and uh, Chayyeh ben Baharach, and it's through him that we're related. Uh, see where the yellow lines are? Yes. And it uh, goes down here, down, down here. There are Simon Leib down here, and uh, over here. This is my great grandfather. And this is his uh, his father, and this is uh, the oldest Gustav. This one doesn't exist. That was a figment of somebody's imagination. And uh, uh, from here, through another line, uh, uh, this was uh, my great. 
great, great, great grandmother's uh, mother, they were from Hemsbach. You talk about where they are getting information. There's a fellow who was descendant of his, Eric over here. Uh, he has a book from Hemsbach. And it so happens that uh, in Hemsbach they had a big Jewish cemetery. In 1615, uh, they chased the Jews out of Worms and they scattered to all these small places uh, in the Rhine Valley there. And uh, of course they couldn't have uh, cemeteries at every little place. So there's about a thousand graves in uh, Hemsbach. And uh, there was a shamus there, you know what a shamus is? No. It's like a sexton in the, in the, he knows what a sexton is. Uh, and he did a tree and I got a lot of information from that. And he cheated a little bit because in one part he put in an extra generation. Half of it is in German and the other half is mostly in Hebrew. But I got help uh, uh, on that. So, so what's that, the earliest time did you go back to? On this? Uh, to uh, Kaufmann from Butzbach up there, 1375. I can't read it. I would imagine that it gives you... Can you, you shoot uh, a screen uh, from a, uh, a monitor, the picture on the monitor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's zooming uh, in I right can now. Pull, I can pull it up on the... I mean, everybody's got a connection, but they don't always know it. But you know. Well, this, this, is, this goes way back. This goes uh, 20 years back, 15, 20 years. And this is a small uh, uh, part of uh, what I have. But it, in terms of your, your identity, your sense of self, you have a concrete bit of evidence of how far you go I, back. I was busy enough so that uh, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> but it, it is, uh, I found out that most people uh, have uh, an inborn need to know where they came from. That's why a lot of information is on the back and front pages of Bibles. If you have a family Bible, you see the other places, uh, the, the German Jews and even the Polish and Russian uh, Jews, they, the congregations had what they called memor uh, It's like a diary where they uh, re recorded the birth, uh, bris, uh, the circumcision, the ceremony, and the marriage, and the bar mitzvahs, and the so forth and so on. They recorded the whole thing. And uh, I stopped short of trying to uh, get the information from those. I know that the, the books for Worms, Memmingen, and uh, Gussmannsdorf, where my family comes from, the oldest Gussdorf, uh, they're all in Jerusalem at uh, archives there. I'd have to hire somebody who was conversant in Hebrew, German, and, and uh, English. And uh, I got enough. Yeah. I'm Do done. you have any documentation that pertains to the, to the journey of the thousand Jewish children in 1940? Oh, this guy in L.A. has got all that. Uh, okay. I didn't know if you had any pictures or anything that since that is an important part of the story. And we did touch on that, but we didn't explore it. Well, the, the, the ship, uh, the Kona de Savoia, we got a picture of that. It's Let's show. on display in, uh, in the Holocaust Museum now. Okay. And, uh, well, let's, uh, let's go in the other room. Picture of my fishing tackle. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, the uh, cabinet I was talking to you about, the, the dental display case. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had a, we had a painted or finish it about six times because the uh, the wood cypress wood is so porous, it just sucks it uh, up like a sponge. That's my cuttiest fish uh, trout there. You caught that personally? Personally, all by myself. All right. <laughs> Tell me what this is. Tell, let's, That's uh, the Oppenheimer tree. How did you come into possession of this family uh, tree? So, uh, Hedwig, uh, Hedwig's uh, granddaughter, my father's first uh, uh, segment here that you can see here. Let's see. Sigmund Sigmund Arlung was my grandmother's 
brother, and Hedwig is the Oppenheimer. It's my uh, great uncle, great great parents, and it goes down great 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 parents, and down all the way to here. They made the cousins married here. This this uh, this guy, uh, not these guys. These were the guys who uh, who had this done. Uh, he was the big shot. He had this factory in Michelfeld, uh, Michelfeld, and uh, that's where they uh, did Napoleon's uh, uniforms for his army. And some of the Gustavs uh, worked there before they came to the United States. This is the home and this is the factory. That's amazing. It's a great uh, artifact. I think so. Yes, absolutely. And I, I only got it after I, when I was down in Hollywood, Florida, where, where, they, where my father's cousin lived who had this. And I photographed each section here. I just threw away a whole bunch of the, and I, with, my, with a magnifying glass, I got all of these. So you can see how many people there are. Yes. Uh, they don't, these don't mean much, uh, don't mean anything, I mean, but I put them in there anyway. I got the information, so I put it in. That's good. Let's go into the room. And uh, there, there, this, this is a good one. Yeah, that's me, cloud fishing. <laughs> I like that, too. But this is uh, my mother. What you see in there, in computerized form, there's, remember I mentioned Caroline? Yes. The Maya Lib. And this is Abe, the oldest. It's 1630, you can see down there. Now, what is it that you want? Oh, you wanted my immediate family? I had this made to put in. Oh, this is great. When did you do this? A couple of months ago, when my daughter, my daughter, L.A. daughter, threw the... I, I, I couldn't... Reduce this down. This is a computer. This is where that comes from. This is a computer version, but I have no way of putting it into the uh, into the uh, uh, genealogy. I had to have it eight and a half by eleven. Right, and this makes it look organic. Literally, the family tree. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm going to put it in the front. Uh, and I got uh, pictures of Gusman stuff in case you're interested in that. That's where the, all the family came from. And the where, original family name was Gusmansdorf? That's where they uh, came from. When did it change from that to Gusdorf? 1801 is the first evidence I have uh, con documented. Uh, first use of uh, Gusdorf. I have a list. Uh, come on. What the hell? How much of your memory project do you have on computer? All of it. All of it? All, all the, uh, you know, my, for instance, uh, my autobiography, th th this section of the software only, uh, uh, only has five pages. And uh, my... Uh, This is his son, uh, and uh, he was married twice, so I have to go to uh, Rachel. And uh, here's my great-grandfather. This is Judah Leib. I have a, a, a color picture of him. He was born in 1813. And uh, what was your question? I'm just amazed that you have so much of it, you know, in your computer. In, in software. I know that you've got hard copies of files and files and... Yeah, yeah but I'm uh, transferring all that. That's great. The stuff you have on the wall out there, the, your family tree, did you have this on here too? The stuff that... Yeah, a fraction of it. I, I, you know, whatever, when I switched to uh, computerization, my, uh, uh, that became, uh, you know, just obsolete. I mean, it, it's it's all in there, but it's part of uh, a lot of stuff because there's just not room there. 
It, uh, what are we talking about now? Well, let's... Uh, oh, my grandmother... Shimon Shah Abdullah for spouses, let's see, in the... Okay, uh, uh, And you're working on an autobiography? I got it done. You've got it done. How big yeah. is your autobiography? 41 pages. Yeah? 12 point. But uh, my... Uh, uh, my grandmother, yeah. Her, this is her bio. Did she compose that or did you, or was that composed about her? Uh, she had a, a, a diary uh, that uh, went from her marriage to, uh, from uh, her youth to, uh, uh, to uh, First World War, where her youngest son died. And what is her name? Clara Adlung Gustav. How did you come into possession of that diary? Oh, my father saved it, and he had it uh, retyped. He had it translated into English, which was horrible. I had to do the whole thing over again. It's, uh, it's, here's uh, five pages of it. That's, uh, see, I got it done by 5.19.05. That's it. In her memoir, she writes and so forth and so on and so on. And, uh, for instance, my father, uh, is his, uh, what the hell? Hope I didn't lose it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, wait a minute. That's this. A lot of older adults don't get computer savvy, but you are. I'm impressed. I'm impressed too. Oh, I'm an, <laughs> I was just a sleekly amateur. We got all kinds of problems that we have to get fixed all the time. But uh, that's my father's, and uh, you want to see my uh, uh, autobiography? Yes. See, the last entry was uh, in, uh, 424-208, and... Uh, Do you keep adding to it or wanting to add to it? Well, I revise it. Okay. She made an entry about our Panama Canal deal, and I just, uh, just took a lot because... Uh, we went on the European Odyssey, we went... Uh, Morocco, well, uh, I went, uh, this is boring for you. No, but you've, you've revised this as, as recently as a month ago, so you're still never finished with any of this well, memory we, project? we went down to Panama Canal and I put it in there. But uh, we started out in Agadir in, in, uh, in uh, Morocco and, and uh, went all the way down there. It's page 37. See, uh, Santiago de Compostelo. You know about that? No. You're Catholic? Yes. That is the most second, that's the second most popular uh, Catholic pilgrimage in the world. What was the name of it again? San Diego de Compostelo. I don't know it either. Since I grew the 12th up century, yeah. it is the second most important Catholic pilgrimage site in Europe after Rome. And it, uh, we witnessed the swinging of the uh, Bota Fumeo, an incense burner swinging 130, weighing 130. 43 pounds. The leader, uh, uh, David Byrne, said it's the largest deodorant in the world. 
in the years past, pilgrims would arrive after a long, strenuous trek and sleep inside the cathedral. Things got pretty smelly, so the incense was necessary. We saw him swing it. I got it on tape. Hmm. We've been all over the world, but probably... La, La Caruna. And uh, from there we went to uh, Saint-Jean-de-Louis, uh, that was an interesting place. And then from there we went to Bilboa and Bordeaux, and uh, Auguste lives there, a retired guy. He was a professor at uh, Strasbourg University, but not related. There's a Bart Piemont, uh, Auguste uh, and they have a big, big family. And, and, uh, up there in that box, you see where it says by Pierman, other unrelated customers? Yes. <laughs> if I yeah. live long enough, I'll make a degree for him. You've even documented Gustavs you're not related to. That's amazing. Well, uh, you ask, uh, again, I say, how, you ask, how did I get information? Well, one of the guys here uh, was a guy by the name of Rudy Joseph. And uh, he lived in Santa Monica in the summertime, in the, uh, in the wintertime, in the summertime, he went to Baden-Baden uh, in Germany. And he was interested in uh, the, uh, his ancestors. And he had an ancestor by the name of Abraham Gustav, and so did I. And he did all the research until he finally found out that his Abraham and my Abraham were not the same. His Abraham was a generation younger. But uh, until then, he uh, researched the whole thing and. Uh, then I have a woman in uh, Worms who was 81 years old in, in, uh, on March the 20th who uh, did all the legwork. There's a book up there, a the little black book. She chronicled all the, uh, everything they known about the Jews who uh, lived in Worms between 1933 and 1945. Another book up there, the blue one on the right, called Wormasia. Uh, it has a thousand years of Jews in Worms. He chronically is a professor. He, he was just honored by the Overmeyer organization. And next to that is a, a book uh, with all my schoolmates uh, that uh, died uh, as a result of the Holocaust. Yet, yeah. see that? You were gonna. Uh, Photograph the yes. temple. Here's all, all the people. This is the woman who who, who uh, uh, didn't make it. The mo her mother made it to the United States, but she uh, lived in the house, the doctor's house in Worms. It's all all this stuff, you know. I mean, who's interested? One of my schoolmates here, on and on. This is Chris Kosman. It was his, her, her brother who did the, who uh, did the, uh, walked around the, those uh, big schnauzers and so on and so on. There, uh, when they died and all that business. How many kids do you have? Three. And have they helped you with any of this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so and so and so forth and so on. Document section. Everything that refers to the document section. My next memory uh, uh, memories are from 1929. And you asked me about that. And, uh, and uh, this is... Uh, uh, the poem that I had to recite. Uh, also during the visit, I attended Uncle Eustine and Mary's mother's brother and sister-in-law wedding. I remember standing on the banquet table uh, to recite my father's composition. I remember the first paragraph only while he put in a supply, etc. My best translation is because my brothers are still too small. They had to stay at home, thinking about their big brother and all the goodies that he's enjoying. The Guster Factory. That's great. Yeah. Why don't we take a look at uh, some more of the uh, archival pictures that you've got? All right. You want to get out of this, or you want to keep it? Uh, uh, put it up. Uh, let's. Uh, 
Well, let's let's look at maybe upstairs at some of those photos. Uh, the Guster factory got started on this street here. When did that happen? 1910. 1910. Is that a postcard or an original photo? Yeah, a postcard. All right. There was a woman here who had a thing about postcards, and when she got a German one, I got a, I got to translate it. That's a great artifact. He's a, he's a documentation of the uh, ancestors and family origin of the Otto Oppenheimer family. You ask where I got the information from? I have to sift through all this crap here. And you've showed me marriage records. You've showed me all kinds of documentation going back centuries. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I got my uh, great-grandfather's marriage contract. Uh, 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 spells the Guster name three different ways because uh, the Hebrew alphabet has uh, several S's and F's. So sometimes they spell it with a double F and sometimes double S. Even though uh, his father used the name Guster, T-U-S-D-O-R-F. Well, that's a revealing fact about the fluidity of spelling. It, 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 I mean, uh, you get into this and uh, uh, you feel like you're living in that area, yeah, you know, uncle so on, so on, this one here, and so forth and so on. Where was that taken? Uh, in uh, 44. That looks like a winning smile. Were you happy at that particular moment? As happy as I ever was. How old were you there? 19. Right. And you come to America, you join the service, and then you're fighting in Second World War. You could have possibly, you're still in the war effort. Yeah. Did you, how did you feel being, you know, at war well, in I, the European uh, I, could, I could have stayed out another half a year, but I felt that I should join when I was 18. So a sense of duty made you do it. I don't, it's an emotional thing, it's not a, not a matter of reasoning. If, I had, if it was a matter of reasoning, I would have stayed out. Okay. But uh, that's, uh, uh, the customers were a lot of answer, uh, artists. Uh, this is uh, Monty Guster, that's a Leopold, one of Leopold, uh, Leopold's uh, uh, descendants. Okay. A thing from the Wall Street Journal. Oh. Yeah, this, this guy came up the mountain to talk to the guru, and the guru says, the real meaning of life is not to fret and bug yourself about what the real meaning, meaning of life is. This is one of my persecuted by... Uh, this is my grandma. That's, that's the picture that they cut the head out of. Oh, so you still have that. No, it's, uh, it's... Well, I mean, you still have... A number of copies. It's, you've at least got an image of it. Yeah, it's, it's a photograph. It's not color, but... That uh, piece of... What's that uh, thing that she wears? Who's got that? Ruthie, are you? This alone is an amazing artifact. <laughs> Everything is an amazing artifact. It is, true. You like this one here? Yeah. You know who that is? Um, Gerald Ford. Yeah. What was the circumstance for you meeting I won Gerald fifth Ford? prize in the ten tennis tournament uh, down in Florida. You're kidding. No. You know this one here? Um, she was the... Uh, our representative of the United Nations, uh, uh, Carruthers. Kirkpatrick. Oh, Pick Gene Patrick. Kirkpatrick, yes. yes. Gene Kirkpatrick. So what was the president like? He had a big hand. He squeezed my hand. I thought I'd never get it out of there. Yeah. What year was that taken? Maybe uh, 1987. 1987, okay. There's a letter in, in here that... Uh, describes the circumstances. Wow. The, uh, we did a lot of business with Cena's Radio Corporation and uh, 
they had a convention down there. We attended their conventions and displayed our electronics furniture. Uh, and uh, there were some of the guys played golf and some of them played tennis. And I played tennis uh, with some of the guys. You know, Best Buy and uh, these people, Circuit City. Sure. They were all there at one time and uh, played tennis with them. The guy uh, who started a city, a Circuit City, uh, Wurzel is his name, he used to come, we just display at the music show and he'd come by and give me some good advice. They were in Indianapolis at the time, now they're in Virginia. So you were playing tennis pretty well in your 60s then. If that's 1987, by that time you're 62 years old. Yeah, well, I didn't start until I was 55. Really? Now I just play Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Yeah? Yeah. Here, uh, can you get it without reflecting? Yeah. Can you narrate this picture? Yeah, it's Alaska. That's and where I caught the, And when the, was it taken? 67, I think. There, there it is over there. Well, that, uh, yeah, that's that's right. And this is my uh, my son Randall. He caught a 32 pounder. That's a king salmon. That over there is a 26 pounder. Don't that make you jealous? Yeah. Do you, do you eat what you catch? Not this year. No. Their cooler, what they passed as a cooler, they have a house with sawdust in it and uh, uh, big pieces of ice that they uh, put in there in the winter time, and then they put the uh, uh, send it down to Bush's Cove, and I picked them up uh, by our park. Let's go upstairs. Uh, and, uh, and oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Emblem for the 70th Division. How was morale in the Signal Corps when you served? It was good. I mean, all enthusiastic. We didn't have any of that crap we have today. Yeah. This is a... Oh, this is a good one. Uh, they named the street after her. Oh, okay. Hold that thought and tell me a little bit about the background of this particular photo. Uh, we were stationed in Whitney, uh, and uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, sergeants or one of the higher ups arranged for us to make a trip to uh, Rouen and included uh, Mont Saint Michel. I got a videotape of Mont Saint Michel. I got, as a matter of fact, I got a, a painting of uh, Mont Saint Michel. Yeah. Give me that. It's old. The, the, and uh, tell me about this one again while, while he's got this. This is the mayor of Worms, and uh, uh, this was a dedication of a street uh, to honor Hedda Mansbacher, the one that uh, blocked the entrance to the uh, uh, synagogue on uh, Kristallnacht. This is, of course, uh, the city wall. I'm the, glad that she got recognized. Yeah. A little late, but uh, you notice 1943. Yes. And she was uh, uh, 58 years old. She looked like 68 to me. That's the. You got it? Mm -hmm. This is where I was born. Now, this is not the. Uh, uh, that is not uh, the way it looked when I lived there. When was this picture taken? 76. It's one of my kids there. Yeah? How did it feel to return in 1976 with your family? Uh, I, I felt uh, very much ill at ease during the uh, 10 days we were there. I was looking over my shoulder. Now, uh, 12 years later in 88, uh, everything was changed. Had you changed or it, had it changed in Germany? Mostly they changed, uh, and I did too, uh, uh, because in 76, uh, uh, 
the people who uh, perpetrated a lot of this stuff uh, were very old, uh, still alive, and about 12 years later, they were mostly dead, except me. That's good. That's good. Yes. This is, this is a, did you get this here? Mm-hmm. Huh? Hold it up for me. This here? Yeah. This is the Mrs. Fowler. You can see how, how big she is. This is uh, 1935 or thereabouts. This is 1976, and she was 86 years old then. What did she have to say in 19? I got it on tape. You want to listen yeah. to it? Yeah. <laughs> An hour and a half. <laughs> uh, she was still feisty, and, uh, and uh, she told us a lot of things that we didn't know uh, before. But. Uh, this is on the roof of our home. This is a factory. Now, this is, uh, these are my foster parents, uh, Bessie and Leo Garfinkel. How long did you stay one in year, touch with them? One year. Or you lived with them for a year. Yeah. And then uh, did you keep up a relationship at all with them afterwards? Uh, in, uh, we got separated for, by about, I don't know how many years, but then we got close again, and uh, I did the eulogy for, for when he died, and uh, she, she lived a lot longer than he did. That's that trunk that uh, my father made three of. What about these pictures here? This is, these are my brothers. Uh, and this is Bessie Lohenhaupt. Uh, she's quite uh, well known as an artist. Her books published with the uh, stuff, the pictures all over the place. You done? Okay. This is, uh, my father was big on, on mountain climbing and uh, skiing. He had a teacher certificate in skiing. He was an equestrian. And, uh, uh, expert cabinet maker and, and antique uh, repair and all that. And he must have been about 15 years old then. This is my... Uh, <coughs> this is where, where he got that testimonial for the, the new temple, you know. That this was the 25-year-old rabbi that I mentioned. And, uh, is uh, my mother and one of the guards at the factory. And I don't know whose cat that is. This is uh, in 1937. Our school made a, an excursion to Heidelberg. The Heidelberg Castle is very famous. The Heidelberg uh, University is very famous. They uh, had a thing about where the uh, uh, if you were a uh, student with it, you had a scar. You had, you had, you, they fought with sabers. And really? They, they, yeah, they got a... This is uh, my cousin. And, uh, he, uh, he's doing a... He's giving a lecture on the Holocaust this afternoon. Where? In Los Gatos. Yeah. And th you wanted uh, this year of uh, my family in early days. That was before my youngest daughter was born. This is in 59. My youngest daughter was born in 61. It was our first vacation together. They got sick in Sparta, Tennessee, and we had to stay there for a couple of days. The double F. Yeah. If Flair can get a shot, we, I've got your audio narration from last week. Yeah, now what do you want? Oh, maybe just a, a quick shot. Mm -hmm. Huh? Just well, to show it on the video. This is the, the shoots brief uh, by the sober. Von Gebelstadt. Uh, 
And this is the uh, uh, actual uh, copy of the actual 19, uh, 1751 protection letter. I, Johann Friedrich, uh, something uh, sober, so forth, and so all the way down there, it's got titles. This was a standard form that they used only to change the names. And uh, I read uh, after I saw you, the uh, issued these uh, protection letters only one time, uh, so that uh, all the uh, children and everybody, close relatives, were protected. In 19 in 1751, wasn't necessarily uh, when he became a protected Jew, but that's when the 1751 protection letter was uh, issued because uh, his son uh, was born in uh, 1768 and uh, so he would have been only 17 years old see uh, but uh, he was probably born in uh, Maya Marsh was probably born in uh, 1730 between 1730 and 1740. That's the signature. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the door that uh, had a month uh, uh, clock. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where in uh, 1934 there was a big memori memorial deal that I attended for the 900th anniversary. And uh, this is how it looked uh, after the war. Uh, there was a picture you saw where the walls were still standing. And this here uh, looks like this here today. And this is the uh, Jewish cemetery at Worms, uh, which is probably the oldest uh, in Europe. I don't know whether the temple is the oldest or this is the oldest. But uh, my uh, great grandfather and so forth, they were all buried there. This is how it looks today. Cousin Frank. Mm. Got it? Mm -hmm. Last picture of, uh, of the fifth and sixth school year. And what year was that taken? Yeah, let's lay it down. Uh, I was uh, started in uh, in 31, so that may be 36. Okay, point, point to you in there again. Where you at? Right there. dissertation of the place in the country. That's his watercolor stuff. Your family is artistic. Yeah. So my daughter and uh, grandson we had lunch with this day. So, I mean, he wrote the whole hi history of, of uh, he made all this stuff here. I translated it. I don't know who the hell would, would be interested in it. How long did he live? Huh? Your father? He was 90, he was 76. Okay. Uh, 
And the rabbi asked me, well, what religion was your father, this and that? What happened to your mother? My mother was Jewish. Well, you're Jewish. You don't have to convert. Yeah. That's uh, cousin, that's me, Cousin Frank. But yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's the way we're using it. I think this will look just fine. This is me and that's my wife. I think I have uh, a copy of this. Uh, <coughs> can you get? Uh, can you get to it? Mm-hmm, I can, but I want I want you to talk about them first, and then I'll shoot them afterwards. Okay. In other words, you just go ahead and point to them, and I'm going to get you talking about them as to who they are, and then I'll get a picture of them. Well, uh, this is my father. This is his brother, and uh, this is one of the faculty manager, a couple of uh, girls from the office, which was here. And I was born on the second floor of this building here, and the faculty is back here. Okay. Yeah, it's my father, his brother, faculty manager by the name of Felka, and a couple of office girls. This is where the office was. And uh, going down this walkway came to the entrance of, my, of our home, and I was born in the room behind the front here. Uh, that is uh, interesting, but I think I got it up there. This is uh, my mother's, my mother's uh, mother when she was four years old. And remember I talked to you about uh, the woman that had 17 kids that was pregnant 17 times? That's her. That's my alert, her husband, who came to the United States about 1872 to see whether they want to come here, but he uh, decided not to come here. That's my m mother and her uh, uh, siblings. He was uh, in World War I, and they killed him in, uh, out of gratitude. It's my uh, mother's sister brother and that's my mother. Do you know when that picture was taken? Uh, 1899. Probably uh, 1899 or 1900. My mother's name, buddy. Okay. How'd you meet your wife? By accident. Can't blame anybody. <laughs> uh, my sister-in-law uh, was she was a studious person, and uh, and I would like that. And uh, I knew I was going to marry her the first time I laid eyes on her. 